hello and welcome to the Curry Knits podcast. My name is Erin and I'm so glad that you joined me here today. I just got back from the lovely Tobamori, so the footage that you just saw at the beginning was from the cottage that I was at and we just spent a lovely weekend up in that area. Uh, Tobermory is on a whole bunch of lists of like the most beautiful places in Ontario and we had some really lovely hikes. I will say it still doesn't compare to BC but for it being so close to home I can't believe it was the first time I had ever been that out that far. Um, I've been up to Muskoka era, area but I've never been up to Tobermory before and the hikes out there are really really gorgeous so I'd absolutely recommend if you are looking for something to do in Ontario Tobermory is a lovely place to be we were there in what they consider the off season um, which I didn't actually know apparently the season runs until Thanksgiving and we were there the Tuesday right after Thanksgiving and so uh, people were uh, someone had actually questioned my husband like why why are you here <laughs> but we got to take in the fall weather and have some beautiful hikes so i would absolutely recommend going up this time of year we did get a lot of rain um and i did go out in the kayak for like all of five minutes but uh the water was very cold and the kayak that they had was very uneven <laughs> so um i did not stay out there very long my dog threatened to drown me by trying to jump on the kayak he swam out to me and then was like asking to get on and i brought him on and he immediately jumped off so um that was very kind of him um i had actually filmed out there as well i thought i would do like a picturesque location for the podcast which would be really lovely and uh it is the wind cast it is all wind and so until i get a better audio visual setup i don't think outside uh outside filming is going to be in my future at least not for prolonged periods of time so and the wind was very it was not as windy which is why i thought it would be okay um but I guess it was windy enough that it was the wind cast, unfortunately. I will start off by talking about what I'm wearing today. I am wearing my Sobble slipover. I think last time it was finished, but it was unblocked and it is now blocked and the pattern is now available. And so if you don't know, um, this is basically the exact same pattern as my Sobble tank, but I have made it into a winter form so you can have Sobbles for summer and for winter. Um, I just extended the neckline here and I extended the ribbing on the bottom. I'm going to stand up and show you how it fits. So I ended up making a size four and I kept the recommended ease just so the patterns would be the same at four to six inches but that creates quite a close fitting uh slipover so i'd recommend if you want that looser fit that's a little bit more trendy nowadays uh to go up a size than what you normally would and what the pattern technically recommends so it just kind of depends on the fit that you're looking for and if i'm being honest i wish i would have gone up to a size five for myself i am a 40 inch bust if that gives you any frame of reference so i'll just show you So it definitely has ease, but I think like those really big flowy ones that you see going around nowadays, um, it is a little bit more tight fitting than those ones. And that's perfectly okay with me. This is um, Knit and Drops Lima. And that was a yarn that I had actually never used before and I really love. Um, I had picked up a sweater's quantity of it in Copenhagen and then ordered a little bit more to, in order to make my husband a cardigan and then the cardigan thing kind of fell apart and so now I have just got copious amounts of this I probably have enough for another actual sweater's quantity um but this slipover was just perfect I really love the color I really love how the neckline is long but it doesn't like come up super far obviously you could keep knitting it if you do want that but I like that I could have a collar poking through I really I don't know I just really like the look of it with this long ribbing and so if you already have the Sobble tank you will find this in your inbox and if you are interested in the Sobble slipover the Sobble tank will link, lead links to it down below so before we get into all the whips that I have because I don't have a finished object to show you but I have an almost finished object to show you um, I just like to thank Anna Luisa for sponsoring this video. Anna Luisa is a timeless jewelry brand that has amazing pieces that are hypoallergenic and sustainable which are two things that I really love and appreciate. I really got to appreciate their hypoallergenic claim um, because I recently got my ears pierced and I'm wearing Anna Luisa jewelry far earlier than um, you're supposed to change out the jewelry that they pierce you with. I was in a wedding I got my ears pierced two weeks beforehand and changed out the jewelry about a week and a half in which is uh, not what they recommend at all but I changed it out for these huggies here and it my ears were a little irritated when I first did it but they have not been irritated since swelling down down almost immediately and I've had these in my ears 
uh, basically since, and it's been two weeks since. So, um, and they have not irritated my ears at all. And I am someone that the reason I let my ears close in originally is because I had earrings that irritated my ears and it was difficult to find earrings that didn't. And I am super duper impressed that these haven't irritated my ears at all. I'm a side sleeper. They've been great for side sleeping. And honestly, I have plans to get many more pairs of Ana Luisa earrings just because I have been so unbelievably impressed with their the quality of their materials and their ability to not irritate my ears, especially because I put them in again like a week and a half after they got pierced. So very impressed. I thought I would have problems that I actually didn't. So that is fantastic for me. They also sent me some other pieces like this necklace here. This is the Ina Silver necklace and it's kind of like one of those trendy TikTok-y pieces which I really love. And then I got a set this is a bracelet and ring that have the same motif on them. Um, this like knotted detail here. And I really like them. Ana Luisa has their birthday sale on right now. So you can get up to 30% off many of their jewelry pieces. But if you aren't interested in any of those or want to use my discount in particular, you can use the discount code CurryNits20, which is down in the description box below. And that'll get you 20% off your order. So thank you very much to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this episode. I'm going to start with the sweater that is almost done and I think has been on my needles the longest out of any of these um and the one that I'm having a bit of a problem with unfortunately so this is the tendril sweater from the knit pearl girl it is in testing but it's coming out this month I think it's coming out in about two weeks which means that I need to hurry up um so this has been on my needles since June this had a really long testing period it has these beautiful zigzag motifs I have knit and blocked the body. Um, there's a lot of different modifications for this sweater, which I really appreciate, and I think you will too. Um, you have the option to move this uh, little cabling section either to closer to the outside or closer to the inside. And my advice for this is actually, if you are someone that is more petite this way, like in the shoulders, I would recommend putting this closer to the neckline, which is what I wish I did. Um, let me show you really quick so I can show you exactly what's happening with it. Okay, so here it is on. I think it's looking great. The The thing with the cabling here is that because it's so far to the outside, when I wear my arm, when I wear my arm, when I place my arm normally, the cable gets a little bit lost in like the crinkling of it all, the way that it comes in on itself. And I think someone with broader shoulders, and I've seen other testers and they had not have this problem whatsoever. And on uh, Sophie's body, um, it's weird to talk about someone else's body, but here we go. I think it looks perfect with the cable on the outside. I actually preferred her version with the cable on the outside and that's why I chose to do that. But I think and she's not like a broad, I don't think of her as broad shoulders, but she is, I think, taller than me, if I'm remembering correctly. And so I think her body is just like, this is coming closer to here. And so it fits perfectly, but mine is coming out a little bit. And I, it's not a gauge thing. I think it's just where it falls on your body. And so if you, I think it would also happen if you're larger chested. So it, I would say that if you are more petite, if you would consider yourself petite, I would recommend putting the cable on the inside. And then I also chose the split hem option, which admittedly is looking a little bit wonky right now, but it looks really good on, I promise. <laughs> when I take proper shots of it, I'll be able to show you. But my problem right now is actually with the arm. So you might be able to tell the arm is fitting a little bit tight. Um, and the yarn actually looks different on camera, but it is not showing up lighter in real life like that. So I don't know what's going on there. It is the same yarn. It feels exactly the same. But yeah, I don't know why it's so showing up so much lighter on camera. That's funny. Um, it's showing up a lot lighter on camera. I don't know what's going on. Um, so anyways, this is of course a pattern and testing and I added a note to Sophie. It might just be a me thing. I do have, I think, um, proportionally larger arms to my chest size. So I cast on the right arm amount of stitches for my size, started knitting, and it is, as you can tell, the sleeve is tight. And that is not the way that the sleeve is intended to fit. And it's not the way that I would like the sleeve to fit. So I am going to be ripping this out and casting on probably about 10 more stitches in the arm and doing it again. She has us picking up uh, the arm stitches, I think at a 
two to three ratio. So you pick up two stitches for every three. And I find that for my armholes, I tend to go for a three to four ratio. And so it might just be a preference of arm fitting, it might just be a difference of portions of bodies. I left a note to her to say like this stitch count was way too small for my arms. I don't know if she's going to change it because again, it might just be me, but um, I am going to be like, you can see just how much it's stretching out over the black fabric here. I'm going to be ripping this out, which is sad. And then I was experimenting with putting the cable motif um, opposite, like upside down on the top of the arms here. And I'm not sure if I'm going to continue that um, with the repeat of the sleeves. I like the idea of it, but I'm just not 100% sure. And so let me know what you think you would do. It's not part of the pattern at all, but it is, she said that we were free to make any kind of um, adaptations that we wanted. And so that was one that I was considering. Let me show you properly when I take this off. So I'm kind of letting this fall off the needles a little bit here because I know I'm gonna be ripping it out anyway. Um, but I had just started to do the cable motif there and kind of started it the way that it ends backwards. And I think that it could be nice going up the side. I think I would start it up earlier, um, but it does slow down the sleeve quite a lot. And I'm at the point where I kind of just need to get these done. And so I may not do it for the repeat for the, the second time I'm doing the sleeve. And it's a shame that I didn't try this on earlier. I worked on that all through the cottage and I, I am about 60% of the way done that sleeve and if not more, and I have to rip it back, which is unfortunate. And the other problem I have, which is completely my fault, um, this yarn that I'm using is Blue Sky Fibers Wool Stock Worsted, and it is one of my favorite yarns. If you didn't know, I talk about it just all the time on this channel. I'm constantly using it. It's one of my faves. Um, and so I actually ripped out a sweater to be able to knit this. I had made the Snow Crocus sweater by Minori Hirose, and I just didn't love the fit of it on me. I wasn't reaching for it. And because I was knit one of my favorite yarns, I was really sad that I wasn't wearing it very often. And so I decided to rip it out and re-knit it into this sweater. Um, so I had created, because these skeins come in 150 gram skeins, once you're rolling it out of the sweater, they create big balls. <laughs> and so I had three big balls of yarn that I was working from for this sweater. I have lost a ball. I've lost a ball and I have literally, I'm looking at my office right now, I've literally no idea where it ended up. Um, I wonder if my dog ran off with it. He's giving me a look like, no, I did not, mom. Um, but I don't know where the big ball went. So I went tearing apart my space and then I went tearing apart my stash and I found out I had leftovers from that sweater that had never been knit. And so that's what I'm working off of. I'm about 60% on that sleeve and this is how much I've left. I might have enough for both sleeves actually. That could be fine. I also would just love to find the bi the bile, gross, the giant ball of yarn that is just somewhere in my house. Um, it is, yeah, it's very strange that I've lost it. I wonder if it's in a bag somewhere. I tend to put all of my whips in uh, reusable bags just because I don't have any project bags. I think they're beautiful but I think that I'd rather spend my money elsewhere and I get these for free. And so I just put all of my whips in tote bags and I wonder if it's sitting in a tote bag somewhere in my house. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to find that. And so that is the one reason where, why I think, like, is this yarn a slightly different color? I don't know why it would be because part of the skein had already been knit into the sweater. And this is, this is the right skein. I triple checked. So um, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. But hopefully I am able to find that giant ball of yarn and I can continue and finish this sweater in the next two weeks because I need to. And testing is a fantastic, I, I realized, I'm realizing how much I relied on testing to give me deadlines because clearly I have been a little bit unhinged in my knitting choices lately. And speaking of being a little unhinged, let me show you my brand new cast on. <laughs> So I talked in the previous podcast about desperately wanting, and podcasts before, desperately wanting some color in my life. And I have knit, cast on something with color, and this is a sweater that I've been dreaming of for about six months. And it, I have the idea for a saddle shoulder 
that had a cable design on it, a really exaggerated cable design on the saddle. And I thought that I would make a traditional saddle. I was actually just thinking of amending the uh, Lakes Pullover by Ozetta, which I made and is a sweater that I wear often. It's probably one of my most worn sweaters because I not only made it um, in wool sock worsted, but I also made it in green, which is my favorite color. And so I reach for it just all the time. I love the fit of it. I would definitely make another one, but I wanted, I then made the April Cardigan by Petit Knit. And she does a really cool thing in the shaping of that cardigan, which I wasn't expecting and which I really liked. And it gave me the idea of how to make a saddle shoulder in the round. And so that's what I'm doing with this sweater. I'm calling it my Calico Skies sweater. And that is based off of, let me show you the sweater and then I'll explain the name. So this is Calico Skies. It has a beautiful braided motif along the top and it will go down the arms and it is a saddle shoulder construction. This is actually the perfect way to show it. I love it. And so I have just finished the yoke and I have done about an inch of the body and I just adore the color, the way that it looks, those cables, those braided exaggerated cables and the cables, the most important part to me, go right up the neckline. And so because it's a double folded collar, you have your ribbing and then you have the cables going straight up and then they'll go straight down the arm. And I just love them. So the way that you do the yoke is you do increases on either side of the saddle. And then once those are complete, you then widen for the arms and it's fitting really well. I got to try it on when I slipped for the arms. That was great. And I am just obsessed. So this is called my cal, as you can tell, but I just continuously hold it up. <laughs> this is called Calico Skies. Calico Skies is one of my favorite, not one of, it is my favorite Paul McCartney song. It is off of his 97 album, Flaming Pie. If you didn't know, I'm mildly obsessed and mildly is an understatement with Paul McCartney. He is my favorite artist of all time. My dad has an amazing photo of me just like crying on the floor of his concert. Um, I adore him and his music and I actually prefer his 70s music to his music in the Beatles, although I love the Beatles. And one of my favorite albums that's kind of an outlier from that 70s um, is 90s, his 97 album Flaming Pie. I think it's one of his best albums and it's kind of unexpected because it's in the late 90s. Like most people aren't thinking of Paul McCartney's music in the context of the late 90s, but if you want to listen to some amazing, um, what people call today dad rock, um, I highly recommend his 97 album Flaming Pie. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it, um, but I would say people in my generation really don't listen to it very much. Um, but I think it's amazing and I listen to it all the time. I love it so much. Um, it has a lot of my favorite Paul McCartney songs on it, but Calico Skies was one of them. Calico Skies was actually going to be our wedding song and we had a pandemic wedding and so we did not get our first dance. Um, but I always think of it as our wedding song nonetheless because it is in my heart and that was what I was going to choose and um, my husband very graciously approved it. So this is the Calico Skies sweater. It also has short row shaping which is fantastic. So the neckline is going to lift on the back so that it fits you um, properly and isn't choking you out, which was really important. It took me a little bit to figure out how to put short rows into this, but I figured it out. And yeah, this pattern will probably be going for testing probably late November. Um, I wanna finish the strike off first just to get a little bit off my back. And I'm really excited for this one. I am knitting it in Santa Scar and Pure Gint. And this is my first time using Pure Gint in this stunning blue color, which is 6046. Um, and it's my first time using Pure Gint and I get the hype on it. It's a really lovely yarn to work with. It's very comparable to Cascade 220, I think. Uh, maybe just slightly rougher, but I've really enjoyed working on it. It's a very round, very twisted yarn, and it's very easy to work with. And I would definitely opt for it again. I think it's lovely. Um, and I think it's at a decent price point as well. It makes me want to try Sunday, which I've also never tried, uh, just to compare the two, because everyone says that they prefer Sunday, but Kiergent is the budget option. And like, there's not as much of a difference between them to justify 
the cost difference to many people, but I want to see what they mean by Sunday is a better yarn. So maybe in my future I will knit a sweater in Sunday. I don't see many people just knitting in Sunday, it's usually with the tinsel mohair, whereas I see a lot of people just knitting in pure gint. So I don't know. Future to experiment with. Um, Santa's Garn Mohair is some of my favorite mohair, so I can see myself also knitting with mohair in this yarn. And then there's also Tin Purgant, which is their fingering weight purgant, and you know, I, I would be open to trying that one day as well. Next thing I have to show I should have worked on more. I had intended to work on more. I brought it out to the cottage as the sole thing I was going to work on, and then I brought a tape measure, and I'm still at a point where I'm going to need that quite a bit. And it is my second Shrek cardigan. I'm making this alongside my testers and I'm very behind. I just finished the back panel. Um, so that's what it looked like. Obviously it goes this way. And yeah, it's not, this is the worst advertisement for this pattern ever. It's not that I don't like working on it. I love working on it. It's that I want color and this is black. It's like a brownie dark, dark gray black um like there's some there's like a warm hue to it which I actually really love um but it's black and I've just been craving working on some color and I think it's gonna go quicker now that I can do the shorter cardigan rows and then it'll get long again but then it'll get short again like th this cardigan is really fun to work on I love broken rib it's one of my favorite patterns it's why I made a cardigan then um, and I want to get the sample done because I want it to be part of the photo shoot where I do the photos, but to do that, I need to finish the cardigan. And so I will be working on this a lot more and it's annoying because it's not the yarn. I love the yarn. It's not the pattern. It's the color. And I should have just chosen a color that I'm more excited to work on. It's to the point where I'm going to, um, I'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm going to a knitting fair on Saturday and I'm considering getting a sweater quantity in a brighter color and then just recasting it on in a brighter color but I should not do that because this is um something that I actually need in my wardrobe my black cardigan that is store-bought is literally falling to pieces so I desperately genuinely need a black cardigan in my wardrobe and I need a cropped black cardigan in my wardrobe because I wear it most often with dresses and skirts and so I know that this will be well used in my wardrobe and so I just need to keep working at it and hopefully with the calico skies I can kind of switch between them and get that color that I need and my tender isle sweater which is beige um, is almost done and then I can cast on another brightly colored item and I know what that's going to be actually I know that it's going to be the Colette sweater by uh, sorry Nerdlin, which I had applied to test for. I didn't get the test, but I'm still obsessed with pattern and I bought it as soon as it came out. And so I am going to be casting on the Colette pattern by Sorry Nerdlin, which I'm very excited for, but I need to finish the tender out before I cast it on. I haven't seen many tests that I've been overly excited for lately. Honestly, the Colette has been the pattern that I've been most excited for I think like in the latter half of this year so far. I'm certainly open to test knitting still. I had some people ask me if I was no longer test knitting. I would love to test knit still. Um, it's one of my favorite things. I just haven't lately and not for any particular reason. I just haven't, they haven't come across my desk and I haven't seen one that I've been super excited for. So if you have any that you're super excited for, um, let me know. I am certainly continuing to keep an eye out for things, but I just haven't found any yet. Or if they have, like, I don't have the yarn for it. There was one that was a super stripy sweater and it required, or it's either, I don't have the yarn for it or it would take way too long. And I just know that I'm not in that headspace. There was a fingering weight cardigan that I saw that was stunning, but I'm like, I do not have the personal conviction for a fingering weight cardigan right now. <laughs> And there was one that was super stripy and I thought I'd have enough of Cascade 220, but I didn't have a base color for it. And I was like, I don't want to have to go out and buy more Cascade 220 right now. I would love to make a striped cardigan or sweater with all the Cascade 220 kind of leftover skeins I have. And so I've been keeping an eye for something that might work with that. Um, but I don't have a base color to kind of bring it all together. And this one required a lot of a base color. And so didn't end up going for that either. 
that was a tangent. So for this sweater, back to the shark cardigan, I am knitting this in Wellington fibers. Let me grab the skein. This skein has seen some better days, but I am knitting this in Wellington fibers, which looks like this in the skein. This is their 30-70 base, 30% mohair, 70% wool in the color Wellington charcoal. It is a sport tweet yarn and it is just stunning. Uh, Wellington Fibers is one of my favorite fiber artists. They are Canadian and so I am doing this as part of the Great Canadian Make Along which is a make along that I am running alongside We'll See Knitting. Uh, Rachel, she is fantastic and I loved her video where she explained why we're doing this and her reasonings for it so I will link that down below. In dialogue with that I just absolutely love what she said about uh, the fact that we often see all of these Scandinavian designers and creators using Scandi yarns, as well as non-Scandi people using Scandi yarns. I just talked about Santa Skarn, which is based out of Norway, and I love Scandinavian yarns. When I was in Copenhagen, I felt like I was in heaven, in yarn heaven. But I think we as Canadians often get yarn FOMO because they get these yarns for so much more affordable prices, and we have to spend so much more for them, and we're not looking in our backyard for the yarns that we have access to. And so one of the things that Rachel said that she really loves about this is that she's getting introduced to more Canadian yarns, and designers and that is something that I really love about this too. I have always had a love for Canadian yarn, especially vintage Canadian yarn, um, but I haven't had my kind of finger on the nose. That's not the saying. Now my finger's on my nose. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I haven't had my finger on the pulse. I think that's the term of what's going on in the Canadian wool market. I have been to local wool markets and I've seen certainly some Canadian designers that I admire, but I haven't used as much of their yarn because I've always been like, oh, it's expensive. But I'm at a point in my life where I would like to spend a little bit more for quantities of yarn where I know where they come from. I know that they're local. I know that the processing is done with care. And so, I am actively looking for Canadian yarn now and to be able to see people making wonderful things with Canadian yarn has been such a treat. All that being said, I am super happy to be working with a mill here, to be working with yarn from a mill that is less than 100 kilometers from my home. Obviously that's not a requirement for this make along or to be working with Canadian fiber, but that's just something that I feel really, really good about and that I love. Um, and I will hopefully be seeing them at a fiber festival very soon and maybe getting more yarn from them. But looking through the hashtag on Instagram, which I will put up above, it is really wonderful to see what everyone else is making out of Canadian yarn and to be introduced to so many more Canadian makers and designers and dyers and spinners and everything else. And so I have some fantastic news from this make along since Rachel and I announced it on Instagram. We've had some people reach out and donate some prizes to the make-along. So first we had Jenny of Honeybird Studio reach out and offer two copies of her beautiful Birkeland shawl pattern. It is a pattern that I have just loved ever since she came out with it and she's also one of my favorite podcasters and so I would definitely recommend checking out her channel but if you're a shawl person I would absolutely be looking to her shawl as something to cast on from a Canadian designer. She's based out of the West Coast. Yeah, I just think it's beautiful. If I was a shawl person at all, I would have already cast it on. Um, but I'm so happy that she's donated two copies of that pattern. And so that will be going in the prize list for the MCAL as well. We also have Ginger Snap That offering a lumberjack sock set. Um, they are some local dyers uh, and our Canadian based dyers, which I had previously not known about at all, but they reached out and I really love their lumberjack sets. They work with a lot of brights, but their lumberjack sets are a little bit more muted. They are beautiful sock sets. And so I will put a picture up of what they're donating. It is a beautiful sock set if you were into socks at all. They remind me of socks. This is going to be a very hyper local reference, but socks that you would get at uh, Lensville or well, what's less hyper local. <laughs> like, Brass po Pro Shops, um, those kind of worker socks, they have a kit of socks that kind of look like that and they're stunning. And again, if I was a sock person at all, I would be um, kind of chomping at the bit for these sets. But uh, I think they're beautiful. And so that is another thing that is on the list as well, along with the prizes that myself and Rachel are contributing to this make along. So uh, we're really excited to have you along. Just use the hashtag, um, the Great Canadian MCAL 
which is online, should be on the screen as well, will also be in the description box below in between now and December 31st, and you will be entered to win these prizes. Uh, and I've had some people ask questions, can you do this and submit it into another MCAL? Absolutely, if you want to do more than one, that's completely fine. And are whips allowed? Yes, just like have more than like a line of knitting on your needles. I think Rachel had said around 25% of the garment, but like within reason, just like don't have the stain and a picture of your needles sort of thing. Just, you know, be within reason. Post that hashtag on Instagram and it'll be all good. And I would love to see everything that you guys are making with Canadian fibers. I also had a couple people reach out um, and I completely agree and I just wanted to raise it here. A lot of people had mixed feelings on entering a MCAL that supports Canada in a way. For myself, I am not nationalist. I think that nationalism is really dangerous and I do not support everything that the Canadian government has ever done and that is completely normal and okay. And a lot of people have those feelings as well, especially those who are Indigenous. And so I just want to acknowledge that all of the yarn that we're using is coming from Indigenous land. When we're talking about Canadian makers and dyers, I want to support local people in my community. I think the easiest way to say that is to support Canadian makers. But obviously, if that is a line that you feel kind of iffy about and you're not sure that you want to say Canadian or support Canadian in that way, I completely understand. Obviously, there's no pressure to enter it all but you can find where that line is for you for me i'm okay with supporting canadian makers dyers spinners etc but i wouldn't necessarily want to support something where we're like knitting for the government or something because <laughs> that would be weird for me personally but obviously your mileage may vary and it is completely fine whatever however you feel on that and that is what i will say about that because um, you guys did not sign up for the political podcast, but I completely understand that no action is not political and I understand your hesitations on it and know that I share them. That's all on that. I wrote one more way to share. It is also part of the Great Canadian Make Along and it is my wrap shawl. And so this is made in vintage Canadian yarn. This was the one, was this one from Blythe? Or is this the one from Philosopher's Wool Co? It is from the 80s. It is from an Ontario-based spinner. And I had gotten this secondhand and it is beautiful. I had like 10 skeins of this and I am making a wrap vest with it. And so I'm to the point where the wrap is wrapping. And so it's kind of sitting like this. Obviously it is um, really coming in on itself here. But this is what it's looking like. I have, I think, 12 more increases to go. So like 24 more rows until I am done the increases. And then I'm going to do a double knit band all along the bottom. It's just to the point where the rows are really, really long. And I knew this would happen, but they're really long. Um, so I've done about this much from, this is probably the best way to see it, this much from the arm split. And... I'm really liking the way that it's turning out so far. It's just, I've been doing one or two like sets of rows a day, basically, like one or two increased rows a day because the rows are so long and the pearls are really killing my hands. Um, just because the yarn is a bit rougher as well, I'm super interested to see how it blocks out. I should have done a swatch, I did not, but it is also extraordinarily strong smelling. Um, it smells so much like spinner's oil. I should definitely be working with this outside, but I'm not. And I'd rather, I'm just destroying my lungs instead, which is just a terrible idea when you have asthma like I do. <laughs> but I haven't actually noticed it um, irritating my throat in the same way that like working in the archive does. So, you know, historian, we do things for the love of old things. Uh, if you don't know, a lot of archivists get a very specific kind of cancer <laughs> that comes with working with, in the archive in the mold that develops on old vellum and paper and things like that. And so as a historian, I'm cognizant of not spending too much time in the archive. And thank God uh, for 
technology where I can go and take my photos and look at my documents at home. Not only because it's unrealistic for me to move where my documents are, which is in England, for this career and like to uproot my life every couple of years so I can spend time in the archive, uh, but also so that I save my lungs from the immense damage that these documents can do to them. But I've been working in another environment where I've been working with old paper a lot and I can feel it in my throat. I don't know if you've noticed my voice has been rougher the last little bit. It's because I'm working with old paper and it has mold on it and I'm wearing a mask and I'm not wearing the mask that I should wear because it hurts my face and I know that's not an excuse but here we are. We all make our choices. <laughs> I'm limiting my exposure but I still think it's impacting my throat a little bit and I bet this yarn isn't helping but I don't really have much else to say about that. Um, hopefully next time I see you I will have a little bit more progress. I feel like I might leave it for three weeks until the next episode just because I feel like I'm working on a lot of the same things and I would really like to have new things to show you guys. I've been alluding that I'm going to be going to a yarn festival and I decided kind of last minute that I'm going to be going to Woolstock in Paris. Ontario, <laughs> not the exciting Paris, which is a yarn festival that I've never been to. And uh, I've heard it called the poor man's rhine bag uh, because it's usually around the same time. And it is a smaller yarn festival, but it has much more Canadian uh, makers, dyers, creators, spinners, even lots of spinning wheels. Um, I looked at the list of people that are going to be there and I am very excited. I linked fibers is on the list, so if I don't find anyone else, I at least have them to fall back on. But I'd love to find a really beautiful sweater's quantity of some variegated yarn for a really cool sweater idea. It's not like the sweater design itself is cool, I just have an idea of how colors can play in a sweater like that, which I'm really excited for. I'm thinking like a lento, like something very basic, but I want some beautiful yarn for it. So I'm excited for that. Um, the one thing I'm kicking myself for is in Kitchener, they have their yarn festival thing that went on, I think the second or third week of September. So just passed and Koigu was there and I didn't know Koigu was there. I've never seen Koigu at a festival and they are a yarn producer local to me, way more local to me than I thought. They're about an hour and a half from here uh, that I love and I've always admired and I've never made a sweater's quantity of their with their yarn and I really wanted to get some and so then I looked at Woolstock and they're not there which is really annoying. So I wish they were and I wish I had gone to Kitchener specifically to go to the Koigu booth but I did find out where I was at and Tobermory went right past the Koigu farm and I thought well on Google, it said that they were open on Fridays for shopping. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're coming back on Friday. We ended up coming back on the Thursday. It's a whole thing, but I'm not gonna get into it. We ended up coming back on the Thursday, but if we were coming back on the Friday, we would have been driving past it during its very limited opening hours. And I was very excited. And then I realized they're not actually open on Fridays. That must be a holdover from a time gone past. And so I did not go to the Koigu farm, but they are hosting an open house in a month or so in mid-November. And so weather dependent, I might go to their open house. It is about an hour and a half from here, which is a bit far to go, but I am really interested specifically in their Quarrydale yarn. And I was going to order it online, but it is not cheap. Sweaters quantity for me would be around $150 to $180. And I really want to feel it before I buy it. And I really want to see their colors in person, just because their colors are spectacular in their uh, very bright but I want to make sure I'm looking for like a white with a rainbow speckle but I want to make sure the rainbow colors are the right rainbow colors if you know what I mean <laughs> so I think it's gonna make just the most beautiful sweater but I need to make sure it's exactly what I'm picturing if I'm going to be spending so much so I might go to that but in the meantime I do plan on going to Woolstock in Paris and I'm very excited to go to that. It's an outdoor festival, which I love. Um, whereas the other ones I think I've been to in the area have been indoors. So hopefully the weather holds up for tomorrow. It's a beautiful sunny October day today, but I actually haven't checked the weather for it tomorrow yet. So fingers crossed. And if you're there, I this video might come out before I go, but it's more likely after. So if I saw you, hello again. And if this comes out before and you see me, please say hi. I love meeting people at these festivals. I'm very excited to talk to the dyers themselves about their process and their yarn. I love talking to people who are just as excited about fiber as I am. So it's just a wonderful place to be. I gotta figure out what sweater I'm gonna wear. Very exciting stuff. 
but yeah i think that's all i have to say for today all the details about the mco are down below and i would love to see what you're making i would also love if you in the comments put down what your favorite canadian fibers makers designers are even if you're not working with them right now i would just love some more people to look up in my life um and to keep an eye out for what fibers and producing, especially fibers and